Peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Our introit is 64, verse 2. Be, I am the Lord that healeth thee.
want to welcome you to our service this morning. The people of Westmount Presbyterian Church and First Presbyterian Church are pleased to welcome those who have joined us this morning, people from other churches, other parts of the province, and other parts of the country. And indeed, we even have people from out of the country occasionally who join us. So welcome, everyone. We pray that you will feel the love of Christ in our midst today. In terms of our announcements, we're continuing with our Zoom Bible study, and we're using the book, We Make the Road by Walking, and that's going fairly well. We're basically halfway into the Bible study this year, and if you want to join up, you can join up at any time, and you can contact Ayla or Nick or myself to uh, be part of the Bible study Zoom. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let us worship God. Our hymn is 291, Thou Whose Almighty Word. of approach are printed in the bulletin and we pray them together in unison. Let us pray. God, we thank you for Jesus who invites the weary to come to him. Some of us are weary, Lord. Some of us have weary minds. Some of us have weary bodies. Some of us have weary spirits. We are exhausted by the pandemic and from not gathering together as a family. We are exhausted by religious squabbles and debates. We are exhausted by the many news stories of politicians and the powerful who have abused that power. We are so exhausted sometimes that we fail to see the gifts and resources you have for us. Forgive us for failing to rely on you for strength and power. Forgive us for failing to take the time in your presence where our spirits are renewed. Forgive us when we fail to take the time to serve others, because you teach us that we cannot run out of love. The more we love, the more you give us. Forgive us when we think you have forgotten or abandoned us. Remind us again that you are with us, in us, and renewing us daily. 
Amen. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. God is love when we can cast all our cares and worries on Jesus, for he cares for us. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven.
Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, children of all ages. You know, not every week is a good week. And I've had bad weeks before. One week, my toothbrush went missing. The car broke down. The groundhog saw his shadow. And there's six more weeks of winter, and it's really cold, like minus 33 degrees. And the doctor wants me to go on a diet. And I got in trouble because I forgot to lock the door at night. And I had an upset stomach because I ate too much one night. So it wasn't always the best week. You ever have a bad day? We all do. We all have days when things don't go well and we're sad. What can you do when you have a bad day? Well, I find... One thing you can do is find a friend who really will listen to you and share your story and just tell them about your bad day. And somehow when you tell your friend and they kind of are there for you, it just makes things go a little better and a little easier and you feel better. And you know, one friend we can tell is God. In the Bible it says, God helps those who have big worries. We can cast or give our worries to God, and God helps heal those who have sad hearts. God is like a parent who understands. Or God is like a best friend who's with you through thick or thin. Or God is like maybe an older brother or sister who looks after you if you're in trouble. And like a friend or a parent or a brother or sister, God doesn't make all the bad things in this life disappear. But he just gives you, God gives you lots of love to help heal those days when you're not feeling good. In fact, God gives you so much love, you actually have enough love not only to heal, but to share it with somebody else who's having a bad week or a bad day. Amen. Our children's hymn is 631, Jesus' Hands Were Kind Hands. The responsive psalm today is Psalm 147, reading verses 1 to 11, and we're singing the second refrain. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. The Lord is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem and gathers the outcasts of Israel. The Lord heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. 
The Lord determines the number of the stars and gives to all of them their names. Great, Great is our Lord, Lord and abundant, abundant in power, whose understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden, but, but casts the, the wicked to the ground. ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. The Lord covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. The Lord, the Lord gives, gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. The Lord takes no delight in the strength of the horse nor pleasure in the speed of a runner. But the, but the Lord, Lord delights in those who show reverence, in those who hope in God's steadfast love. Reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 28 to 31. Hear the word of God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. The Lord does not faint or grow weary. The Lord's understanding is unsearchable. The Lord gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And a reading from the epistles from the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 16 to 23. Hear the word of God. If I proclaim the gospel... This gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I become as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, although I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law but am under Christ's law so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I might share in its blessings. And a reading from the Gospels, from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 29 to 39. Hear the word of God. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered round the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. 
and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed, and Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone's searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring town so that I might proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came to do. And he went through Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Praise God for the reading of God's word. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rescuer, our rock. Amen. In the 1984 movie Splash, a man played by Tom Hanks falls in love with a mermaid, played by Daryl Hannah. There's one scene where Tom Hanks gives her a present. As a mermaid, she's never received a present before, so she doesn't understand that the present is inside the gift-wrapped box. She thinks the present is the gift-wrapped and if you've ever wrapped a present for a cat, you'll find out that the cat enjoys the box and the wrappings more than the present inside. It's kind of adorable. But this week, I'm taking it as a kind of metaphor. Last week, we talked about cults and dangerous qualities of religious groups. And I think the metaphor of a pretty box with a ribbon is a metaphor for the way some people think that the religious organization and the structure and the rules are more precious than the gold inside, the treasure inside. And the treasure inside is loving and caring re relationships that religions espouse, relationships with the divine and with each other. And it's always a danger, I think, that religion becomes more important than the divine itself that the religion which espouses divine love sometimes gets caught up in its rules and regulations and is less than loving. And that's why I entitled the sermon Fool's Gold. Fool's Gold, also known as iron pyrite, is comprised primarily of iron and sulfur and has a metallic luster and a brass yellow hue, and so it looks a bit like gold. And sometimes people dig it up and they think they found gold but they've just found pyrite, which is an actually not useless. Pyrite comes from the Greek word meaning fire because pyrite, you could strike stuff on it like steel and make sparks to light a fire. Today, you can actually find pyrite in energizer batteries. But the point I'm trying to make is that sometimes we think something is important and it isn't as important as we think it is, and we miss the real importance of something. And that is true in religion at times. In our epistle lesson, we have Paul writing something that maybe when you first hear it, sounds a little crazy. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law even though I'm not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, although I'm not free from Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all people, that I might, by all means, save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel. It kind of sounds like Paul is a used car salesman or that he's some kind of spy going undercover. And when he's with Jews, he acts like a Jew. When he's with legalists, he's legalistic. When he's with those anti-law, he's anti-law. And maybe when you first hear it, you sound, well, this kind of chameleon performance is not befitting of the world's greatest missionary. Isn't that what you expect? from a salesperson who will basically tell you anything, be anything, say anything, just to make a sale. But I think Paul is getting some, at something. And I'm going to quote from Marcus Rempel, a blogger, a philosopher, a farmer, a pastor, and a counselor from Manitoba. 
and I quote, all the religious and cultural packaging and baggage people carry around is just that, packaging and baggage. It's a container that can be filled with clutter and bullshit, or it can be filled with gold. Paul is after the gold. He's done fretting over non-essentials. He has caught hold of something essential that he wants to share with everyone he meets, end quote. And what is the essential thing he wants to share with everyone he meets? It's the gospel. What we Christians call the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the good news that whoever you are, wherever you are, however you are, you are loved by God and invited to love God and love one another. It's the essential fact that when two people created in the image of God encounter one another and treat each other as the image of God and love one another, then God is alive in that moment. And that's what we Christians call Jesus and that's what Jesus died to show us, unconditional love for one another. Now, Marcus Rempel, in this blog, shared about the time he listened to a conversation between Rabbi Sarah Bassin and Imam Abdullah Antipli. And so I listened to that conversation, too. And it was taken from the podcast On Being, and it was an episode called Holy Envy, which is the acknowledgement that sometimes we can actually envy spiritual practices of others in other religions. Envy their devotion or their commitment. And in this interview, there was an acknowledgement that while the world is full of bad news, there's actually some good news stories taking place in religions, and in particular, how many Muslims and Jews in many places in the world and in North America are dialoguing and building friendships. We often just hear about bad stories that happen to Jews or Muslims or something. But this was a good news story. And the imam talked about his holy envy of Jews. And he said, what I liked about the Jews is their ability to question God, to doubt God, to say, why God do that? He says in his tradition, it's really a bad thing to sort of question God. You just do what you're told. But he says that's something he envies in Jewish tradition. Then the rabbi talked about something she envied, and she envied something in Christian tradition. She says forgiveness is woven into so much of the Christian fabric. And yet in Jewish religion, we just kind of leave forgiveness to one day of the year, the, the day of atonement. But as I listened to the dialogue, I saw what Marcus saw. Two people of different faiths, laughing, sharing deep thoughts, affectionate towards each other, respectful of each other, learning from each other. They didn't have to give up their own faith in order to acknowledge the other's faith and, the, uh, and to love one another. It was a genuine encounter of care between two people who believe in God and are children of God and an example of the gold of each tradition. And to me, that puts the words of Paul in a new perspective when he says, to the Jew, I'm a Jew, to the legalist, I'm a legalist. Maybe he would have said, even though there weren't Muslims at his time, to the Muslim, I'm a Muslim. In Paul's terms, he says, whether one is circumcised or not circumcised, that's not the issue. Your religious tradition is not the issue. The new creation of love is everything to Paul. God is love. Love is God. God loves you. You can love God. You can love one another. That's the goal. And sometimes the religious packaging and baggage and tradition can be fool's goal. Sometimes religious tradition can be the nicely wrapped present and you can miss the gold inside. Now, I'm not against religious tradition or even the rules of religious tradition. Sometimes it's even hard to find gold at all if you don't have a religious tradition. I'm a Presbyterian. I'm proud of parts of my tradition which believes in the priesthood of all believers, which is a reformed tradition, encourages us to continually reform, which believes in a representative form of government, which is acknowledges the authority of Scripture, tradition, reason, and the church. And all of these are subordinate to the Holy Spirit, to God, and the person of Jesus Christ. But my religious tradition 
and your religious tradition is all about leading you to the goal, to love, to God. And in our Christian tradition, leading you to Jesus and Jesus' way of love. Some 23 years ago, there was a movie that was a huge commercial success. It was called Armageddon. And the premise was that the earth was about to be destroyed by an asteroid. Even firing nuclear weapons at the asteroid won't work because there's a lot of mass in an asteroid. The answer is you have to go up to the asteroid, send a drilling rig up there, and drill down to the middle of the asteroid to put a nuclear weapon inside in the middle. And the hero is a driller named Harry Stamper, who longs with his team, takes a space shuttle up, drills down, and plants the bomb. But something goes wrong. And someone has to stay behind and detonate the bomb and sacrifice his life to save the world. And Harry stays behind and sacrifices his life. And the bomb is detonated and the asteroid splits in two and misses the earth. And he saves the world. Another story of Harry saving the world. And while it's a great story and saving the world from extinction is a pretty big thing, it is not the same thing as we understand Jesus Christ and Christ's salvation. Not the salvation that Jesus was taught, talking about, not what we stand in Christian understanding when we talk about saving the world. And I want to use our gospel lesson this morning to get at that salvation Jesus is talking about. In the gospel lesson, it's all about healing. In Mark's gospel, Jesus starts his ministry and immediately he gets right at it. Jesus is a person of action. He takes on evil, casts out an evil spirit. Then he starts healing. Listen to the way Mark tells it. They brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various disease and cast out many demons. They brought all who were sick. The whole city was gathered. He cured many. He cast out many demons. You, you, to hear Mark talk about it, Jesus was in a one-man emergency room and hospital all put together, going from miracle to miracle to miracle to miracle. It was like a hospital television show after a natural disaster. People coming in by the scores to be healed. And Jesus is healing them all. Now that's not the way I remember church. When I was a little boy, I attended a Methodist church in England and the United Church of Canada in New Brunswick when I was young. I don't remember healing services. I suppose those who were sick went to the doctor. And it wasn't that we didn't pray for people who were sick, but the understanding was primarily, I think, that miracles happened in the Bible and they didn't really happen much today. And then, as a teenager, I ended up in the Pentecostal church for a while. And they believe that every supernatural thing in the Bible happens today and should happen today. Speaking in tongues, walking on water, axe heads that float, people paralyzed, walking again, all by the healing power of the Holy Spirit. They took the scriptures very literally. And while at the time I believed in healing like that, I don't think I could ever really say that I saw a supernatural miracle that I could have said, wow, that's it, that's proof. I never saw a paralyzed person healed by prayer and faith, and people still died of cancer and car accidents and heart attacks. There was no parade of person after person getting supernaturally healed. At least I didn't see that, even though I believed it. And so when I became a Presbyterian, hearkening back to some of those main street, mainstream roots, attracted in part, I was to the education and rationality of the Presbyterian church, I kind of went, myself went back to the idea that miracles, at least supernatural miracles, don't happen today, or at least very rarely. And I mean, I was a person of science. I did a science degree at university, and I sort of ended up thinking of miracles more metaphorically. And I was, to be frank, skeptical of the Pentecostal tradition. I saw a lot of stuff that I thought was questionable. But uh, over the years... My thinking's changed a bit. My skepticism has been tempered. My understanding of Jesus has changed. 
For instance, I believe healings happen all the time in this world. In fact, way more than they did in Jesus' day. Now, mostly they do happen in hospital and with doctors and medicines. In fact, I bet you there's quite a few people watching this service today if they've been born 500 years ago or 2,000 years ago when Jesus was alive, they wouldn't be alive if it weren't for medical interventions like uh, operations or drugs. I'm a diabetic. Medicine helps keep me going and keep me alive. Um, well, that's not supernatural healing. Does it have to be a supernatural healing to count as a healing? When I went to college in 1979, Knox College, one of the women who worked there, her name was Eileen Best. She was related to Dr. Charles Best, who along with Dr. Frederick Banting, discovered usable insulin for diabetics. Was not that a miracle of some sort? And maybe just as much as a miracle is that they sold the patent for one dollar so that diabetics would not have to be rich to afford treatment. I believe that God works in many ways to bring healing to people today. And lots of healings happen. And I'm more and more convinced that the primary jo job of Jesus is to heal. Remember when I talked about Harry saving the world in the movie Her Armageddon. So if someone saves the world from an asteroid and from mass extinction, are we any nicer? Would wars end? Would we practice justice? Would there be more equality? Would there be equal access to health care and education? Sure, if Harry could save the world from extinction, that would be wonderful. But who can save it from hate, from prejudice, from oppression, from violence and greed? Jesus offers a way. That is a way... That way is to take up a cross and suffer and die to selfishness and hate and prejudice and greed and be born again to unconditional love, to radical grace and universal forgiveness. And the salvation that Jesus offers is to heal us of every hurt we've ever sustained, every unkind word, every rejection, every name or evil slur or lie uttered against us, every hit, every blow, every act of violence done to our person, every shun, every time we were excluded or isolated by others, every put down, every abuse, every intolerance, every disrespect. Jesus heals us from that to set us free to love to care, to include, to forgive, and to be healers ourselves. The salvation Jesus offers is not particularly to be rescued from physical annihilation or even to escape this world to a better place, even though we believe that we will go to a better place. But it is to be transformed by His love to love. And that love that He promises will never end or die we will be loved in this life and the next life and forever. This healing that we see in the Gospels, Jesus healing all these different people, what I think is so interesting is how important the community was. When a leper was healed in Jesus' day, the leper was now free to enter the community again. Was it free to go to family again, was free to go to worship again, was free to go to work again. This person was healed not only physically, but of their isolation from others. When friends brought a paralyzed man, that man was raised to walk home arm in arm with his friends. When a woman touches Jesus' garment, and she's healed. She's considered by Jesus a daughter of Abraham, a full member of the community when women weren't considered full members of the community. Jesus' healings were not just individual stories of individuals being healed. They were stories of human communities healed from brokenness and disease and unhealthy emotional attitudes. Jesus helped heal the wrappings or the present so you could find the gold inside. Joan of 
Arcadia was a TV series that lasted two seasons, playing from 2003 to 2005. The title alludes to Joan of Arc, and remember Joan of Arc said she had visions that she saw God. And so the title character, Joan, sees and speaks with God, who appears to her as many different people, like small children, teenage boys, elderly ladies, transients, passerbys. And God frequently asks her to do little things that seem to her trivial or silly, but they always seem to end up improving the larger situation. It was quite highly rated, had an Emmy nomination, but unfortunately it only lasted a couple of years. And it didn't always solve the issues and questions about God. In fact, it often raised as many questions. One time, Joan's brother, who had been in a car accident and was a paraplegic, one time Joan asked God to heal her brother. And God replies, well, I don't do that sort of thing. That if... God healed her brother Kevin, well, then he'd have to heal everyone. He couldn't just show favorites and heal Kevin. And somehow, if we healed everybody, then we wouldn't be human, would we? One of the things I liked about the show is the way God appears in so many different people, not necessarily people you would expect, and that the way God works is in people. And I, I find that for my theology, my understanding of God, I think God is in people and works through people. So I wonder if God touched us, if God healed us, that the result would be that we would see God more often, especially in the people we meet, that we would see the gold in people. And if God touched us, and if God healed us, maybe we would be working for God and loving people, and people would see God in us, see the gold in us, and not the fool's gold we sometimes are. Amen. Let's take a moment to pray silently, putting our faith and trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, we don't have the time in a worship service to listen to everybody's story of how you touched them or how you healed them or how you brought them back to life when they were dead inside. But most people who follow you can tell that story of how you touch their lives. And the amazing thing is that when we commit our lives to you and follow Jesus, that you touch people's lives through us. Amen. Our hymn is 391, O Holy Spirit, Root of Life.
Let us pray. God, whose word spoke life and creativity into a formless universe, an order to a nation of escaped slaves, whose strong and compassionate voice challenges injustice through frail prophets, we praise you. Jesus, whose touch smoothed the broken skin of lepers and brought a bleeding woman back to health and belonging, whose hand raised dead girls and refused to throw stones at prostitutes, we praise you. Spirit, whose breath restores souls and bodies and whose presence comforts the grieving, whose fire ignites compassion within us for the healing of all nations, we praise you. God of wholeness, we celebrate the healing you bring to us in our world. There are so many who are in need of healing, Lord, in so many ways. So help people to commune with you, to become centered and whole. Help people to draw close to you to experience your healing touch. And help us to draw together as part of a human family. For indeed, we need the support of one another, the love of one another, the encouragement of one another. For that is one of the ways you are present to us in each other. It is in times when we commune with you that we're lifted up on eagles' wings, that we gain power for our faintness, strength for our weariness, that we who are brokenhearted are healed, that we who are wounded are made whole. God, we pray for the darkness within each one of us. It seems that each of our hearts has a locked place, like a forgotten room or a dark cupboard. And sometimes we prefer to forget that it even exists. But inside it are things that won't always stay hidden. And sometimes others never even suspect that we have such a place. We guard our faces and keep our lips sealed, allowing no escape for the skeletons in this dark cupboard. But in the quiet moments, the unguarded times of solitude, the doors we struggle to hold shut open, and the skeletons... Those guilts come out and dance, mocking us and reminding us, shaming us. And so we ask you to free us from the power and prison of the skeletons in our cupboards, Jesus. Teach us that mistakes and brokenness and failure are part of creative and bold living. And it's okay to own up to them. Remind us what is kept hidden holds us in bondage. And it's very hard to heal unless we bring it to the light. To help us to shine your light on the skeletons and be led through shame and guilt to joy and wholeness in you. Let us know the touch of your forgiveness and healing and teach us to pass this acceptance on to others, to friends, to family and strangers who, like us, pretend to be whole while within them skeletons dance. Amen. Let us continue to worship God as we present to God our offerings. And at this time, we thank you for the offerings you give to the church and to this congregation. And uh, also tell you this is a time when you can think of not only financial gifts, but how your lives can serve God.
Giving is a healing action. Giving is to draw from one's health and strength and resources to give health, strength, and resources to another. The other experiences health and strength, and the giver experiences health and strength. For every time we give, we receive from you, God. Amen. Our closing hymn is 824 at evening when the sun had set verses 1 3 to 6 
your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame in your spirit may not disable you but rather be healed so go in peace may your words be a blessing to others may your actions be full of love and grace may there be healing in your touch and the blessing of god almighty the father the son and the holy spirit be with you and your loved ones now and forever amen Amen, we praise your name, O God. Sing Amen. Amen, we praise your name, O God. Sing Amen. Amen, Amen. Amen, Amen. Amen, we praise your name, O God. Sing Amen. Amen, we praise your name, O God. Sing Amen. Amen, we praise your name, O God. Sing Amen. Amen, Amen. Amen, Amen. Amen, we praise your name, O God.
Have a great day, everyone. God bless you all. Thanks, guys.